my thing with Alfred Payton is this. You look at the, the scrap heap that's available, and I don't like the signing. But I wasn't really going to be thrilled with any of the options. There, there. were no good options. I, and no. I understand that people could say, well, you know, you've got Jeff Teague. Sure. Yeah. But here's the thing. Jeff Teague, he's 32 years old. He last year started and then was moved to the bench in Minnesota. And then he played backup for Shabazz Napier, who we'll talk about in a second. Yeah. Uh, and then he got traded to the Hawks and played backup to Trey Young. Now, I can understand playing backup to Trey Young. He's an all star. Yes. Backup to Shabazz Napier. Not great. And can you know, I just say one more thing about Jeff Teague? Sure. Everybody's assuming Jeff Teague wanted to come here because well, Tom Thibodeau is here. That's what I was just about to say. And I, I just, and it's not just Jeff Teague. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I promise you, I am not saying this out of my ass. Assuming that any player in the league wants to come here, and this sucks to say, I hate the fact that I have to say this, but that is not a safe assumption. You cannot assume that about anyone. So yeah, I have to well, say that again. There was the Indiana connection with Brad Stevens. They just lost Gordon Hayward. I think that plays a factor. I'm not saying what you're saying is incorrect. I'm just saying that it doesn't have to be just like, oh, well, the Knicks wanted to sign someone and he doesn't have to sign here. It could also be he wanted to sign somewhere else. Yeah. And for a guy like Jeff Teague, who has made his money before, again, he's 32 years old. He might say, well, if the backup job, for example, was the one offered to me in New York for $5 million. And if the backup job offered to me in Boston is the rookie minimum, uh, which for him would be about 2.5 or so. Um, again, like I'm going to take 2.5 million less because I've already made my money to contend and to get that contention because I just played for a terrible Hawks team and a terrible um, Minnesota Timberwolves team. And then I made one appearance in the playoffs. So maybe I want something more than just to potentially be someone's backup in New York. And that's yeah. totally fine. But the Berman report felt very vague to me. It wasn't that I didn't want to believe it. It's just the way that he phrased it, it, it yeah. didn't necessarily come off as like one party turned down the other. It, it, it didn't feel it didn't feel certain. And it left me asking more questions than I started with. That's fine. Um, and, and, you know, that's just kind of the way it is. But then you move on to someone like Shabazz Napier. And he, he like, yes, obviously he makes someone like Alfred Payton look far worse and Alfred Payton makes him look like a Steph Curry type, but we're talking about someone who has started 56 of a possible 345 games. Yeah. And you know, if you want to talk about him being in a backup role, then sure. But to me, it just feels like we're talking about the devil, you know, versus the devil you don't. And because we've seen Alfred Payton, it's like, okay, well, we know we don't like that guy. We, we really don't. And we want to go somewhere else, but there's something I was looking for and I found it and it was really fascinating to me which is that, as we know, Alfred Payton and Julius Randle have been on the same team together for the past two seasons. They were in New York this past year, and the year before that, they were in New Orleans. This past season, Alfred Payton logged 1,246 minutes. Okay. Of those 1,246 minutes, a whopping 1,035 were flanked by Julius Randle. That's 83% of his time spent with Julius Randle. The, the season before that? He played 1,250 minutes. 802 were with Julius Randle. That's 64%. For yeah. context, R.J. Barrett played 1,704 minutes. Okay. He played 606 minutes with Mitchell Robinson. That's 35.5%. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So, yes, it tells me two things. One, the Knicks did not do a great job of playing <laughs> R.J. and Mitch. And two... Albert Payton and Julius Randle are playing so much together to the point that it is so hard to separate the two. It's like trying to date one of two Siamese twins. You have to figure out. I was out. waiting. I was waiting. I knew it's. I knew something was coming. I knew it, something look, was coming. You can. You can. You can point to one's flaws and say, "Well, I can see what they're like with and without that person," but it still feels like there is somewhat of a tenuous grasp. And I get it. His offense is absolutely abysmal. And I, I'm not well, trying to sugarcoat it. It, it really what, is. But can I, we talk about I that? The chance, finish what sure, you're saying, because I want to get back to it. I got the chance to get some um, stats from Synergy. And overall, I mean, Alfred Payton on offense last year was poor. That's how he graded. He's graded out as a poor. He's poor in transition. He's a below average player in the half court. Um, you know, he's he's. Not a good pick and roll ball handler here. It's his below average 27th percentile. He's eighth in transition, uh, eighth percent in percentile in transition. It's just not good, but there are some positives. He was excellent in the handoff division. Um, he was 
very good in offensive rebounds and his cuts were excellent. And then you look at his defense, his defense last year was actually rated as excellent. The problem is that, well, he was very below average off screens. He was not good in isolation. Um, but as a pick and roll ball handler, he was good. They rate him as excellent in post-ups. I, there's something to work with. It's not a matter of this is a good player and we should have him in a backup role. It's a matter of, and I can talk about, I have Teague's information here. I have Shabazz Napier's information yeah, no, here. I've got Peyton like... from before this season. It's, I can tell you it is not sparkling, but what I do know is relatively speaking, yeah, it's closer than people think. It does not mean that I am content picking between any of them. I am really not. And but, nobody, and nobody should be right. And the thing is though, because and you talked about this and it's totally true. If you see a lineup that features five players and they're all 20 to say 22 or 23 years old, that is a flaming disaster. Yeah. You need someone who can be a floor general who can direct you a little bit. And Alfred Payton is is actually capable of doing that. Not super well to the point where he belongs here, but well enough that it is an upgrade over the younger players that you have because of their inex- inexperience, because Dennis Smith Jr. is a shell of himself, because Frank Nielakina has just, you know, I still believe in Frank, but I'm not entirely sure it is at the one. There's a lot of unproven here. Alfred Payton is a proven commodity. He's proven that on offense, he stinks. Absolutely. Do not get me wrong. But defensively, he does hold value. And offensively, if you can fit him around three shooters and a big who can operate in the pick and roll, then you're looking for some success. And if you're doing that off the bench, we were just talking about this in the Slack channel for the Strickland. Mm -hmm. If you pair Alfred Payton with Nerlens Noel and you get three shooters like Bullock and quickly, and if Knox comes around, then you're actually looking at a second unit that's not ass. It's actually okay. And it, it congeals a little bit more. But the fact, but that's our bar, right? Yes, of course. But I want I also have been thinking about this. Think about what Saturday represented, right? What would it have been like if Gordon Hayward opts into his contract or Friday night at 6.05 PM, it's a sign and trade to Indiana, or they figure out a way to get him to Charlotte, all of these opportunities. But then what, what happened is that we had our hopes that were very low to begin with, it felt like. And then suddenly Gordon Hayward became an option. And we're really excited about this. Some, obviously there are people who just didn't want that. They yeah. prefer to just be a mediocre team, get a great pick, you know, the Cade Brigade, whatever it may be. That's fine. That's yeah. your prerogative. That's cool. But I think about Gordon Hayward and how him hitting the market changed perception on what is a reality and what is feasible and what is exciting. And then we were so hung up on this idea and it felt like we're not, you know, we're only waiting on him and all the good options are gone. And then he signs in Charlotte. And then it's like, okay, well, you're telling me we waited for Gordon Hayward to sign with the Hornets. And well, yeah, it's the like, opportunity well, signed cost a four year, $120 million yeah. deal, which Knicks fans, the vast majority would not have wanted to touch. Yeah. But and what was the, what was the opportunity cost of that? What, what player got signed during that time? Right. Where it you seemed like at, a lot of the market was in a hold and a lot of the other, te- like, unless you're a team like Detroit, yeah. very few teams had cap space. We talked about the fact that there were only yeah. five teams and of those five teams, the heat basically it's only one the left band now. Back. Right. Well, of course, but the heat <laughs> brought the band back together. You had the Hornets keeping it open. You had the Hawks going after Gallinari, which in my opinion is an awful fit, especially because you've got Collins at the four. I, I don't know him. what they're going to, there's something going on there. It's a mess, but you know, they're trying to win, add win I, pieces around Trey. I get I, that. I don't. Um, sorry, I. I just. I don't. I don't want this to become a let's defend Alfred Payton part right, podcast. And, and you're not doing that. Exactly. We're, it's more. We're just, not trying to do that. Right. It's but more like, just trying to lay out the cards here because you it, have one team. You, when Gordon Hayward was off the market, you had two teams that were really available. I mean, three. What? No, two. You, you had the Knicks and you had the Hawks. Yeah. And the Pistons already blew their wad. You know, within the first three hours. So what you're basically trying to operate with here is. What are we going to do with the leftover money? And and it didn't have to be like Gordon Hayward is plan A because yes, you did have 10 months to plan for this. So if you didn't think, if unless you knew for a matter of fact from the get-go that Gordon Hayward was going to opt out and you were going all in on a player like him, which it really doesn't sound like that was the plan, then you've got a lot of options here. And then after the the, the feeling hits of Gordon Hayward signing with a team like Charlotte, then... It's like, oh my God, we're stuck with Alfred Payton and we didn't get Gordon Hayward. And so it's like a double whammy. Yeah. 
And no, again, but- I think it's it's all about the order of operations here because I'm I'm very much convinced that there is more going on. Well, look, um, it because may not of the happen. fact that there is there is just an absolute logjam again in the front court. You, to me, you do not sign Nerlens Noel and with the expectation he's going to get playing time and keep twenty million dollars of your cap space open and still have Julius Randle. I'm telling you, it feels like there's something in the works there. And I really think that if what if what the Knicks did instead was switch up, whatever, you know, we'll find out what this trade's going to be. For all we know, this trade could happen if there is a trade. Um, oh, with the Lakers? We record this podcast while people are listening. The point being, if you did whatever trade that would be or you do other actions and then you sign Alfred Payton to leftover cap space, then it's a different story. Then it's like, okay, well, we got the big person, whoever that is. And, you know, if they don't get that, then we can start talking about how this is a problem, how the I, Knicks were left holding the bag. And this is, an, this is a, not ideal, but you have to look at Alec Burks, who can generate value. You have to look at the fact that they, they're getting Ed Davis for two seconds. And mind you, I'm, I, I can't be the only one here who feels like it's a little fishy that we haven't heard any official news about Ed Davis being traded to the Knicks. Um, to, I actually didn't me, even pay attention to that. To me, yeah, no, that makes sense. It is bizarre, and what it tells me is that there's a bigger deal going on in the works. Oh, uh, we're okay. Listen, we're gonna get to your craziness in a second. Sure, sure, we're, we're we'll gonna do get that. there. But, but again, I, yes, I agree. It, it sucks to the point that it feels like we are, or at least I am. I don't want to speak for you, but defending Alfred Payton when that's really not the case. It's just looking at the market that's available and the fact that the Knicks could have gone a number of different paths. And like I said last time. It always feels like navigating through um, landmines and hoping not to step on one. And to me right now, yeah. it feels like the Knicks have not stepped on any significant landmines. I know that Alfred Payton at $5 million is frustrating. But it's I know just, that he has a no trade protection because he signed a one-year yeah. deal after another one-year deal. Okay. Who cares? It's I get $5 million. It. But what have the Knicks done that will really hamstring them? And, and yes, you could say, well, they could make a big deal and they could always get out of it. Of course they could. I, you know, if you if you said Gordon Hayward at three years, I could have figured out a way to, to walk myself into that or talk myself into that. Mm-hmm. If you'd said four years, I would have been a lot more uncomfortable. And the only way I would have been comfortable with that type of deal is saying two years from now, I feel comfortable using his salary as filler. But if you it was a right, if it was a fair number, if it's the right deal, yep. if it's the right number and if he's healthy, because we know that he has had some concerns it would have with been, injury. It would have been. Again, to use the same words I used before, it would have been lunacy. Right. But again, <laughs> to entertain giving yes. him that contract, or for that matter, giving eight to 10 of the other contracts that got handed out. Yeah. It I, would have been sheer lunacy. And I'll say this and then I'll, I'll flip it over to you. I do agree that the Knicks are at a lower point and they're building. I don't think they're quite that low to the point that it's, you know, out of the question that they can sign good talent, but it's the sort of thing where you have to build up. Well, they're not because they did. The guy but, like Alec Burks and Nerlens Noel, one year at the money they got, like that's a sign that okay, there's some there's some faith in something that's going on here. Right. I'm just talking generally to be like, we're the Knicks. If shitty player X walks through into his agent's door and is like, here are the teams that could potentially sign you, they're gonna be like, ooh, you know what? Send me to that team. Like yeah. maybe there's a couple of guys like that because there there is some stuff good going on here. But acting like we can just get anybody we want at this point. Even if we pay more, it's not the case. It's just not. Yeah. I mean, re- respect is not given. It's earned. And we tried something similar last year, which was let's just throw money at talent and we'll try to make it work and we can try to flip those players. And the only one that really worked was Marcus Morris. And yeah. granted, it was great that it worked. Um, it, you know, give credit because they did poach him after he agreed to, to go into the Spurs, but it also wasn't necessarily part of the plan. And, Things changed. It worked out for the Knicks' favor. And I'm sure that Marcus Morris is thrilled because if the Knicks don't sign him to $15 million, he doesn't get traded. And if he doesn't get traded to a team that's as rich as the Clippers, <laughs> here's the thing. He was eligible to get, I think it was about 120% of his contract from last year. So he's making, he wouldn't be able to make the money that he's making right now with the Clippers if not for the fact that the Knicks gave him that $15 million to like- begin with. That's this is so this is where it really comes back to for me, because, again, this is not about defending Alfred Payton, who I actually think is a little bit better than you're giving him credit for. I think the he again, it, it, it someone who could just run an offense 
and have the other guys on the floor at the same time as him feel like, okay. And I'm going to, I'll get to the Ray, the RJ Randall dynamic of this. Cause that's real. That's a very real thing. And if people are upset about that, I totally get that. But if you had said to me the day Leon Rose took over that I'd be sitting here five days into the off season and I'd be saying the worst thing that they did was brought back Alfred Payton at a discount, making nearly half of what he made last year. The worst thing that they did. I'd be like, where, where, where's the confetti? Where's the, where are the fucking streamers? Where are the party hats? Where do, where do I go? I mean, do, do I have enough booze? Do I need to go? Do I need to get a keg? Do I have, I mean, are we like, should I hire a bartender? Like that would have been my attitude, especially if you told me all of the, like, here's one. What if the Knicks, A, didn't trade Marcus Morris for first round pick, which happened after Leon Rose got here, and B, signed him to the contract that the Clippers just signed him to, except, oh, wait, they would have needed to give him more because they're a shitty team and he wouldn't have resigned for that number. It would have been probably four for $80 million. Like, what if we were sitting here right now talking about Marcus Morris, New York Knicks, four years, $84 million? How about them apples? I mean, like, so... You know, with all due respect to the conversations about Alfred Payton or Shabazz Napier or whoever the hell you want to say. And like, I just I can't I can't do it, especially when two things getting into the weeds of this one. Alfred Payton, putting aside the fact that he actually succeeded when he had Mitch on the floor with him, um, even when he didn't have any other shooters, like there was like one shooter, sometimes no shooters. Um, like, put that aside for a sec. They. They got a four. They just drafted a four who's going to be able to stretch the floor. Theoretically, RJ Barrett is now better from three. Um, and I don't know who they're going to start at the three, um, whether it's Burks, someone who's not here yet, um, you know, Knox. Like that person should also probably be able to give you a little bit of floor spacing as well. So the thing about like he can't shoot, the offense is doomed. RJ is going to be driving into, you know, four people again. Like, Cool your jets. That's probably not going to happen, um, especially since they have a real coach. That's first of all. Second of all, um, the RJ Randall thing. Again, that's real. Randall needs to go, not because he's a bad player, not even because he necessarily be a bad fit on this team if used in the right role, but because it's just like you said, too stocked up at this point. You just drafted the, the most, arguably, the most NBA-ready player in the draft, and he plays Julius Randall's position. So, and I could say... Again, I can't get into specifics, but I, I know for a fact that they're trying to move on from. Let me rephrase that. They have had discussions about moving on from Julius Randle over the the last several days. That much I could one thousand percent confirm. And I'm not breaking any news by saying that. We've we've heard from Ian Bagley and we've heard from Mark Berman. Like all these people have reported that they would look to move on from from Julius Randle. Um, so like they're trying. It's not easy to move on from Julius Randle. Again, as I referenced, look at the contract numbers that guys who are of his similar archetype and arguably worse got. So um, we shouldn't judge it yet. And you know what? Worst case scenario, if this is the roster that they go into the um, the uh, training camp with, I guess my final question to people would be like, okay, well, what did you want them to do differently? You know, I've heard some people say, well, if you knew you weren't going to be able to get a better point guard in free agency, you should have drafted one and you know, should have drafted Malachi Flynn or you should have, you know, traded up for Killian Hayes or taken Kyra Lewis at eight or whatever the hell. Look, <laughs> to, if you're a franchise that's operating, like you have this opportunity, this lottery pick, these don't come around very often. You have a top 10 pick here. Well, for and, us, they do actually. Well, yes. And, and they, <laughs> and, and, and you know what? And the last time we had, well, RJ was like a no-brainer. I'll put him aside. But before that, they drafted Kevin Knox. Why? Because they needed a scoring wing, right? They needed a scoring wing, and they drafted Kevin Knox. When who else was sitting there? His teammate, Shea Gilgis Alexander. But wait, hold on. They had just drafted Frank Nilakina, right? Can't draft, can't draft Shea Gilgis Alexander. You, Frank Nilakina here. Um, again, love Frank, but had that work out. You take the guy you want. You take the guy you believe in. They believe in Obi Toppin. If he sucks, I'll be the first one to be like, they're idiots, right? Um, as of now, 
I think he deserves the benefit of the doubt. And as of now, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt to have the draft that they wanted to have and feel like, you know what? We're going to be all right. If it, like, I'm sure they had on their board, worst case scenario, Alfred Payton and had discussions about it. What if it's this? How much are we hurt if it's this? If this is the situation that we go into training camp with. And I'm comfortable with the fact that they have assessed that it's okay. And you know what? I don't think that's that ridiculous. 